Okay, so let's meditate together for a little while. <coughs> so make yourself comfortable. And notice that you are comfortable. This is a very delightful place to be, isn't it? Late morning sun coming in the window. Let go of any other worries and concerns you have. <coughs> Take a deep breath, relax your body, and close your eyes. Just let's just be here. Let's just be here in the present. Any thoughts to do with anything other than the present come up? <laughs> Let them be, but don't engage with them. Just ignore them. For just a few minutes, explore the realms of your mind, your body, and your environment. attention move as it will. Now gently restrict the movements of your attention to exploring sensations of the body. Allow attention to move as it will. If you find any discomfort or tension, try to let it go. Make yourself comfortable. you're happy to be here doing this, put a little smile on your face. You may have noticed that body sensations are somewhat dominated by the sensations of movement related to the breath. So let's restrict our attention to those sensations. Let's explore them wherever they are. Abdomen, chest, shoulders, around the nose.
bring the focus of your attention to the sensations of the breath where the air enters and leaves your body at the nose. Follow the sensations in a very relaxed way. At the same time, being aware as you can of other sensations and of the activity of your mind. Nothing forceful in this, this very relaxed. Gradually begin to focus in more closely on the breath, following the breath to identify the beginning and the end of the in and out breath, and a few distinctive sensations in the course of each. Do so without completely losing peripheral awareness.
just be peripherally aware. If you find yourself doing something to do with external stimuli, that's alternating attention. Just allow peripheral awareness to be there. What you're doing is following the breath. Following the breath is like a game. If you miss a sensation, you can catch it next time around.
from time to time I'll say the word check when I do. Let the breath slip into the background while you check on the status of your body and your mind. Particularly notice any pleasurable feelings, happiness, relaxation, contentment. And keeping those in your awareness, return to the breath. Return to the breath, trying not to lose peripheral awareness of the mind and the body. Don't make an effort, just hold the intention. Check. Check. Check.
Which is longer, the pause between the in and the out breath, or the out and the in breath? Sure. Check. <clears throat> and when you return to the breath, try to sustain that peripheral awareness of body and mind as long as you can.
start. Check and be sure to notice whatever is pleasant.
check. Be relaxed and happy. What I hope is that those of you that still experience distraction and dullness might have found your meditation had a different quality because of the checking in. And some of you I know have been meditating for a long time and it might have been like going back to grade school or something. <laughs> but my hope is that it gave you a really firm grasp of the difference between peripheral awareness and attention. Anyone have any comments? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just that when I was doing that your presentation, <coughs> I got this um, more of a feeling, you know, that uh, peripheral awareness is your vast consciousness and your attention is how you explore that. 
Yes. Yes. Rasmus. I really got that from this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Fast, holistic, <laughs> global, and mm -hmm. focused, zeroing in, analyzing. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it showed you that I uh, had a tendency to be an attention junkie. <laughs> Try and do too much in my attention and not trust my correct awareness enough. And so when I'm trying to find out that there's dullness there, I tend to over use attention to go after it. Instead of just allowing it the peripheral awareness to see. Trust it's there. Have the intention, I just <laughs> trust the peripheral awareness to be there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The intention is there. And that's yeah, uh, that's why I added that part again that you don't do anything. You, you let peripheral awareness happen. You just intend it. And hopefully that made it a little less tiring. But did you have... Well, you know, once again, hundreds of times, you know, people say, um, teachers will say, um, uh, at the at the the transition point between the in breath and the out breath and vice versa, detect the pause, and try as I may. There's no pause, and I and I I got very it was I hadn't done this before, but I watched <coughs> the breath and I tracked it, and for me, I'm such a visual person, as you know, I mean, I could draw you an exact diagram <laughs> of how the in-breath is rounded, kind of rounded to the left, and has a, and, and, and without stopping, has a precipitous fall <laughs> to the out-breath, and the out-breath, I noticed, my body sinks. As the lungs lose the last bit of air, it sinks. And then round it to the left, mm -hmm. precipitate down straight, mm -hmm. and it had this exact pattern. Now, sometimes mm -hmm. the in-breath was longer and there was a, a, a longer arch, mm -hmm. and sometimes the precipitation edge on the right was faster. So I noticed all of that, but try as I may, I could not find a pause. It is down. I could go into more detail, but I won't. But, but if so I guess my um, what it, what I was wondering about too is I mean there, there every one of us has a different body. We're constructed basically the same, but there are nuances in our construction. Am I just not noticing the pause? Let's try as I tried. It, it may be that it's very very brief for you. But it's there, you know, and you're not noticing it. The same way, if I throw a ball in the air, it goes up, there's a pause before it goes down. There's, there's a pause. But you may, you may not be noticing it, or you may be expecting something different and not interpreting what's happening. But no matter how brief it is, uh, there's a point where there, the in breath has the, has ceased, and the out breath has not begun. The other thing is that most people don't, at least initially, don't notice any sensations in their pause. So it makes it very distinct. Because once one particular kind of sensation ends, and then a tangibly different kind of sensation begins. You know, between the two, there's sort of a space of no sensation. But, of course, as you observe the breath longer, there ceases to be any period with no sensation, because there is sensation during the pause as well, once you become sensitive to it. The other possibility is that you're expecting to be a, a gap, and instead it's just one kind of sensation ends, another one is present, that ends, and then the out-breath sensation. Yeah. I think that's more accurate for me. Yeah, because I noticed when it came up, it was there's the surge of the breath. So it's stronger on the up upswing. And then it, it goes 
it goes like this and then down. Wide, like that. And that is the distinction that I know. What I would say is you're doing a very good job of observing the breath. <laughs> <laughs> whether, whether you're putting the same label on certain parts of it as I was guiding you to, really is pretty irrelevant. You're doing a really good job of holding and, and discerning the different parts of the breath. Well, maybe for you, the pause is part of your breath. Yeah, it's one thing yeah, right. and then another, but there's not a gap. Mm -hmm. There really is no breath, let alone any pause. <laughs> <laughs> there's, only, there's only a series of sensory experiences. And we conceptualize and impose our conceptualizations on it. But if you don't impose the same conceptualization that I do, you're going to have a different experience. <laughs> Check in on your body and mind. That's that was the important thing. I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Well, you might want to experiment with this some some more in your meditation. But the idea is that that you let go of some of the intensity of your focus on the breath, so that you can more clearly discern the, the way your body feels, the state of your body, and the state of your mind. And then when you, when you bring the intensity of focus on the breath back to where it was, try to retain that, that clarity of that perception of the body and mind. That's, that's the idea there. Um, and, and once again, what I say the word let the sensations of the breath slip into the background and you may interpret your experience in a way that those words don't fit very well but that's all right that part doesn't matter the only thing is that that, that at these points is that you're you're reinforcing your ability to tap into peripheral awareness and to sustain that It was, uh, oh, I did have one more. I was thinking of how uh, I'm actually reading this fascinating book called The Alphabet and the Goddess, which is a whole different topic. But one thing in there <coughs> that I think might be is helpful for this is it talks about the evolution of the brain and the and the eyes, and that the cones in the eye is really like the male attribute or the flashlight, and then the rods are peripheral awareness, literally. I mean, that's functionally, I guess. I don't know a lot about eyes, but <laughs> that's what I got from it. And uh, I, I think that's a nice, it's, that sort of helps, too, to think of it as the attention is sort of the real, if, for people who think of, in the larger sense of male, female attributes, it's like more of a focused uh, you know, part of our awareness, and then the finger's net, if you will, the sort of whole interrelational kind of, been practicing with intention and it seems like there are so many different arenas in which to cultivate intention so many different places to direct intention um, but particularly this time when you said to hold the intention to maintain a peripheral, maintain in peripheral awareness of what's going on in the mind and what's going on in the body I found it incredibly helpful it's like this seems very small thing but uh, it made a really big difference in my meditation. Good. Yeah. Um, I 
been meditating for, I would say, a long time, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think intention is a really important piece for me. But it doesn't, I don't know how much effect it actually has on the quality of the meditation that I end up with. And, um, and, and vice versa. I don't know why sometimes my meditation is just delicious and absorbing, but very mindful, etc. But I just wanted to share, for me today, it was particularly unskillful. And when you said check, uh, there was an assumption in that that one would be absorbed in their attention and therefore need to divert for a moment to check in with what else is happening peripherally. But when you said check, it actually reminded me <laughs> that I was here <laughs> meditating. <laughs> and I, was, I spent most of it just blurring out. Uh, sleepy, um, just in fantasy. Um, I heard the ghost stories last night. That I was in a ghost story, a made-up one. Um, so I just wanted to share that. It was interesting when you were saying check. I assume for most of the people in the room, it was like, oh, right. I have to move away from this, you know, deep absorption to check on what's going on in my body and mind. And for me, it was like, oh yeah, right, I'm meditating. Why don't you be honest and share that? If, if I hadn't said check, at some point, it, the same thing would have happened. Yes, and it did in between your checks, yeah. but, you know, thanks yeah. for that. I actually, <laughs> I actually meditate with, um, with an iPhone program. Um, called Insight, and you can set a, a time, a, a bell, and I have a bell go off every five minutes, just in case I've, I've gotten a little too off, feel off, out in oh, so the field. So doing something very similar, but... Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that, that's very interesting, innovative, and, and it's good, but it does create a certain dependency, doesn't it? <laughs> With the timer? I just had that thought, actually. It's very interesting. Yeah. So, Although okay. sometimes I, I just want to say, sometimes also, though, I'm doing, I spend five minutes doing different things, so sometimes I use the timer for that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, breath, and then mental field, emotional field, meta meditation. So sometimes I just break mm -hmm. it up just to diversify myself. Yeah. So what, where, I'd, I, where I'd like everybody to be is, you get to the point where there's never an opportunity for spontaneous introspective awareness to alert you that you've forgotten what you're doing. Because you've always checked in before it got to that point. And then the next step I'd like you to get to is where you never need to check in because you continuously know and you catch it and correct for it before there would be anything Checking in would be superfluous. I, I already know what's going on. It would be kind of like driving a car. Like you're focusing in front, but then you check your rear view mirror, you check your side mirrors. It's like it's sort of a constant surveillance almost. Or, you know. it, actually, it's like driving a car in the sense that you probably drive all the time and you don't know that you're checking the rear view and side mirrors. Mm -hmm. But you're doing it. You're doing it. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it in a very automatic way at an appropriate frequency. So that it keeps you continuously apprised of what's going on. That's, that's, it, that's the way you want to meditate. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that, I mean, just to use that metaphor, wouldn't that really be just switching the object of attention rapidly? It is. Looking at the mirror to the side mirror. In, in terms of driving, you have to physically move your eyes because you don't, you don't really have enough peripheral vision to, to <coughs> adequately see what's in those mirrors. But nevertheless, when you're driving, you do, you are, if, if you're not, even when you're not checking with the mirror, if something unusual happens in the rear view mirror, mm -hmm. you know it. Mm -hmm. And you put your attention there to see what it was. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you when you <coughs> first learned to drive, you were probably very conscious of checking the rear view mirror and checking the side mirror and looking both ways and you were so, concerned that you would mix and miss something and have an accident. So it's, it, it's like that. It is, you want to become very automatic. And when you're driving a car, you can't ever afford not to direct your eyes at your mirrors of your, uh, from time to time. But in meditation, your peripheral, your peripheral awareness is sufficient to detect 
uh, distraction or dullness before they take over. And then, of course, you develop a strong habit, and then in your daily life, you you begin to be more continuously aware of all kinds of things, including including what's happening in your own life. And it begins to change the way you re, you react to situations. Yeah. So when we were when we were meditating just now, um, I, I noticed. Sometimes when my mind was a little bit agitated, you know, a little bit wanting to be distracted, um, I had thoughts in the background, really. Yeah. Muddy, but mm -hmm. background. And then sometimes when my mind, when, when you said check, I, I noticed that my mind was a little bit dull. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't completely confident in the measures I took as a result of noticing mm -hmm. those things. When I was agitated, I thought, well, if I just... Put my, you know, in, increase my desire to be on the breath. You know, yeah. like, 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 be more curious about the breath. Yeah. Then that will take care of that. And then the dullness, I wasn't completely sure, but I thought, oh, we'll just bring up the energy a little bit. It was kind of a vague thing. Yeah. Right? Well, being more curious, interested, and engaged will also help with the dullness when it's when it's quite subtle like that. It raises the energy up. Because it wasn't like sleepiness. It wasn't. Yeah. It was just a little bit flat. Yeah, that's that's subtle dullness. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Strong dullness. Is <laughs> subtle dullness is that it's not as clear, it's not as sharp. It, it's, yeah. 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 But I noticed it. So. And 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 when it's when it's subtle, yeah, sometimes that's all you need to do is just engage more fully, get interested, say, okay, I'm not going to miss any of these sensations. Yeah. has a brightening effect. So it's almost like the same fix for both problems. Uh, when, when both problems are mild, it is. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. When, when dullness is strong, that's not going to work. No, I know all that. I'm an expert on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, when the mind is very agitated, <laughs> focusing too closely on the breath doesn't help at all. It makes it tense, Yeah, it? it makes it tense. So when the mind's particularly agitated, sometimes what you need to do is just back off and follow it in a much gentler way, not be so intense. So you'd like to take a step back, actually, when the mind's totally bonkers. Right. And you just, you just kind of yeah. chill, kind of chill yeah. okay. What will happen is you'll get maybe just a little bit dull, but it's all right. It's better than that agitation that was so strong. You might go from gross agitation to subtle dullness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and as a matter of fact, it's not unusual to find yourself kind of in a balancing act. You start off, you're a little agitated, and you're a little dull. Yeah. You correct for that, and you find the agitation. <laughs> and, and everybody experiences this. And the, that's the example of the loot that you'll come across in all kinds of books on meditation. Mm -hmm. Don't turn the loot too tight, but not too loose. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? So we'll take a break for lunch fairly soon. And like I said this afternoon, I really wanted to focus on on how mindfulness does what it does, uh, and how to work with it. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there are these different arenas. So basically, the most immediate and obvious effect of being mindful that you that you may have already noticed and that you are definitely going to notice as you become more mindful is that in any given situation because you are more conscious, because you are more aware you recognize more options for your behavior and you're less likely to react out of 
in the same old habitual way that you usually do. That's, that's kind of the first thing that you're going to really become aware of is that I would have usually reacted to this without even knowing what I was doing. But now you, you realize what you're doing. So for example, um, say there's somebody that, that there's something about what they do or, uh, that ha has always, you've always found it a bit annoying. And every time they do it, you react emotionally the same way. And you may actually speak or act in some way towards that person that conveys what you're feeling. And you don't even necessarily notice that you're doing it. You, somebody else might notice that you always do this with this person, but you don't even really realize it. Now you find yourself realizing this. That, and, and sort of that the option occurs in your mind that, well, why do I react this way to this person all the time? So that's, the mindfulness is just bringing you into that kind of awareness where you can examine your reaction. If you, you probably yeah, don't like feeling annoyed. I don't like feeling annoyed. I think most people don't like feeling annoyed. But it's something that it's so easy to attribute being annoyed to something outside of you and just accept that, you know, it's because of the world's fault, I have to put up with annoyance. But annoyance is an unpleasant experience. And a brand new, completely new option becomes available to you with the thought that, well, you know, I don't need to get annoyed. And if I don't get annoyed, I won't feel bad in the way I usually do. Yeah. That's an insight. That's an insight. And that happening on one occasion may not have that much effect on how you react the next time the person does the same thing. But what will happen is you're probably more likely to have the same awareness arise. And if every time it does, you realize that your annoyance is only having an unpleasant effect on you, and you can let go of it, you don't have to hold on to it, after some repetition, you're going to come to a place where it doesn't bother you anymore. You might remember it all. I used to get so annoyed when she did that. But I bother you anymore. And that, that's the kind of effect that mindfulness has. Simple as that. A lot of us have many different habitual ways of reacting to situations that, that pervade our life. To the extent that if, if you if you could objectively observe yourself as you go through through the course of your life and the course of a day or a few days, you'll see there's so much automatic reaction of all kinds. You may have some indulgence that has developed into a habit. Uh, whenever you go to this particular place, you always indulge in this particular thing. <laughs> Anybody have something like that? <laughs> <laughs> and then one day you realize, you know, I'm not enjoying this as much as I thought I would. And I know it's not necessarily good for me. And five dollars for a piece of cheesecake? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's all kinds of things like this all the time. Some are fairly trivial trivial. And some are some are more significant. Some some are really continuously sustaining obstacles to happiness in your life and obstacles to effectiveness in your life. But the more mindful you are, the more you're going to have these experiences. The essence of the experience is just realizing what you're doing while you're doing it, and putting that information together with the fact 
that it's not really serving you. It's not really producing the kind of result that you want. And you have, and the insight part of this, now this is not a Dharma insight, this is a mundane insight, but it's a tremendously valuable one. The insight is, it doesn't make sense to keep doing something that doesn't produce the result I want. It keeps producing an unsatisfactory result. And that insight, well, it might need to be repeated a few times, but it's going to have the effect, effect of changing this particular behavior. So that's that's one of the ways that uh, mindfulness helps to alter a lot of habitual, conditioned behaviors. And mindfulness will make you aware of how much of your behavior is conditioned. It won't change the fact that most of your behavior is conditioned because it's a very efficient way to live your life. So you'll still go through your life with a lot of conditioned behavior. but it will give you the opportunity to eliminate some conditioned behaviors that don't serve you well and cultivate some conditioned behaviors that are much better for you, better for you and people around you. So, this is the most minor effect of mindfulness. But it's a pretty good one. <laughs> it seems Something to me that that's part of the magic of it. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of why you use the word magic, because well, it's so transformative. It really, when I was, when I was thinking, uh, the, the, the thoughts that I was thinking that caused me to use the word magic act, actually had to do with uh, some of the more profound changes that mindfulness makes. Because essentially, if you think about it, what I just described to you is kind of, why isn't this the way we function all of the time? Mm -hmm. Why don't we always notice whether or not what we're doing is, is reasonable and makes sense? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the results are the, the results are really good and wonderful. But there's no mystery to how these wonderful results come about. And I chose to use magic to refer to something wonderful that happens that uh, it's not necessarily obvious or apparent why on earth it's how this happens. You know? Like to you, there's nothing magical about using a telephone, but somebody from 17th century. <laughs> That would be amazing and mysterious. They call it magic. So that's how I was using the term magic. So, but it's the, of, of, of the magic of mindfulness, it's the least magical. <laughs> it's because it's the most obvious. It's the most self-evident. It's, you know, and, and like I say, it's, uh, you realize it. This is just what happens when you are more fully conscious. And this is just what happens when the natural conscious faculties of, of attention and peripheral awareness are functioning the way they should. Where it gets magical, gets really magical, is when really deeply conditioned behaviors that you what you could, thought wouldn't change, couldn't change, change. And, and uh, it's, a, it's an extension of the same thing. Um, when, you, when you are, when you become aware in the current situation, two things happen. One is that you realize that you don't have to react in the same way you always do. And so you can choose in the moment not to. The magical thing is that in the future, you may not do this at all. That's the magic part. 
So it makes sense that, it, it, and it's easy to understand why attention and awareness in the present moment are going to make you aware of more options and allow you to choose a different behavior. The magic is, why does your behavior permanently start changing? Why do these habitual patterns disappear? And the reason for that is, as I've already alluded to yesterday, what you become conscious of, what you have conscious experience of, that information becomes available to all of the different parts of your mind. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, mindfulness, what mindful does, mindfulness does is make information available that otherwise wouldn't be available to the parts of your mind that are actually controlling your behavior that are responsible for generating your emotional reactions that lead to particular kinds of behavior. So, uh, the reason that you, the only reason that you would habitually keep repeating an activity that wasn't really serving you is that the part of your mind that always initiates that activity never never knew it wasn't working. So the magic of mindfulness is that by holding it in consciousness, that information becomes available. So in turn, and so what this does is it points to what, how, how you should use mindfulness. You need to know what you're doing. You need to know the consequences of what you're doing. The consequences are many. The consequences are immediate in terms of the way they Emotions arise, if it's an unpleasant emotion, the way it makes you feel. Uh, the consequences, the immediate consequences of your action are the impact they have on other people, you know, or objects, or whatever else, animals, whatever. You know. But it has an immediate impact on you, it has an immediate impact on something or someone else. Then there's the longer term impact. If you are in the, if you have the habit of allowing little things to annoy you, you probably also have a habit of getting in a bad mood that lasts for hours. And it's the annoyance that leads to the bad mood, right? Mm -hmm. So, to practice mindfulness means to keep tracking the consequences. Just, you know, and, and of course, that sounds like something you have to do. But if you've cultivated mindfulness, what happens is the consequences continue to be tracked. And so a more and more complete picture is being transmitted to the part of your mind where this habit resides. And the more complete that picture is, then the more that that part of your mind is going to take this new information and reprogram itself in a more positive and effective way. And, and quickly, in, in, in the I know it's late. Um, in the in the actual act of, of meditating, the magic piece is to, seems to me to be that when you focus on something, it disappears, boom, like a bubble. Yeah. It's like popping a bubble when you're actually meditating. When you focus on a thought or distraction. A thought, yeah. You, you, and when you bring consciousness to that, it goes away. Well, and that seems so magical to me. <laughs> yeah, that, that is magical. But mm -hmm. if, you get, if you get engrossed in a thought, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. It stays there. <laughs> right. right. But it, mm -hmm. it goes away when you are paying attention to the fact that you are thinking instead of paying attention to the content of the thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that, is a, that is a magical part of it, too. It comes from the fact that you can't really pay attention to two different things at once. Right. <laughs> yeah. But this this more profound magic is that, I mean, it has to do with the nature of the mind. And ultimately this has to do with the, the, the nature of self and why it is that we're afflicted with uh, this ego attachment and belief in separateness and pursuit of craving. Uh, because your mind is this assemblage of different processes that operate more or less autonomously and independently 
and different ones are in control at different times. The only reason that you, or, or the, the, not the only, let's put this in, the true function and purpose of consciousness is that consciousness is how these different parts of your mind communicate with each other. Whatever you become conscious of, if you have the experience of being conscious of something, then whatever it is you're conscious of is, as a, as a result of that process, available to all of the different parts of you. And when that doesn't happen, then these different parts of you are going to keep going on as they have before, thinking that what they're doing is just, just fine and wonderful. That's where the magic comes from. You think of consciousness as a place where information gets exchanged, and conscious experience is the result of all the different parts of your mind being able to know the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Shared receptivity. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting to me is that as I've come to recognize that my consciousness is a shared receptivity of different parts of myself. I had an insight that this is true throughout the universe. And everywhere there is a shared receptivity, there is consciousness. And we may not recognize it at levels below, the sort of one level that we're at, that we recognize it. So we say, yeah, that dog looks conscious, and she looks conscious, and everything else doesn't seem to be conscious. But that's only because we're not at the level where we can recognize it. There is shared receptivity at every level of reality. And consciousness, where there is shared receptivity, there is consciousness. Consciousness is everywhere. It is a fundamental principle of the universe. And even those lesser parts of your mind, they in turn are made of other smaller systems. I mentioned that was kind of a hierarchical arrangement. Smaller mental systems make larger mental systems, and then those combine to make larger still. There's consciousness at every level. But it's not available, you, know, you can't see it easily between levels. You can appreciate it that it's there. A group of people, there is a consciousness, whether we recognize it or not, that's called the Occupy Movement. And if we understand the nature of consciousness, we can recognize that it's there. We can recognize, and, and we can observe it working. There's a consciousness that we call like every organization, every 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 corporation, every 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 assemblage of human beings, where they share the same information, are generating a kind of consciousness, and we may not have a direct experience of that, but it's there. It's there. So what we're working with here is we're working with our level of experience of consciousness. And it's the only thing that we have to work with. There is nothing else. Everything else that the mind projects as real, everything else that we infer as being real, is nothing more than that. It's an inference. The only direct experience we have of all is our consciousness. And it's the only thing we have to work with. And it's very easy to realize most of what's going on in your mind isn't conscious. <laughs> and because it's not conscious, you don't have any direct control over it, but you have this one way of influencing it. You use, you use the consciousness, you use the one thing you have. And the more effectively you use it, then the more magical the results will be. So that's the true magic of mindfulness. It is, it is the effective application of consciousness, the only thing you have to work with. And if you use it effectively, 
and all the unconscious parts of yourself will come into alignment and you'll become a far more effective and happy being.